in those days, um, Lily and Crane looked the way they do now, in the brick dorm and the apartment house. And that's it. Everything else has changed. Um, first off Crane, where the garage is now the, for deliveries, was Jim Graham, the glass blower. And he not only blew specialized glass for all the scientists, but he also blew little uh, birds for, for the occasional chil children that he would allow in to watch him blow. And you've seen those little glass birds in shops sometimes. And of course what he would do is put a, a hole in the back of the neck of the bird and you filled the bird with water and if he, he didn't tell you exactly where the hole was when you blew the water came right out and hit you right in the nose which made him laugh hard but <laughs> I think we all learned um, how to make bird call burbly bird calls with Jim Graham's glass blowing another thing that that was unique about the time and I was thinking of it last night is that the top of Lily and Crane didn't have all of the salt water tanks and all of the other equipment that's up there now and so we would stay up there to watch the 4th of July fireworks, which were in this harbor instead of the Falmouth Harbor. Um, and what a, what a spot to view from. The do re mi houses were three small houses in a row. They're in several paintings right where Swope is now. And the Ray house was where my father lived when he became director. Before then, Phil Armstrong had been director for many years and lived in a small house near where... Um, What's the new name of that building? I still call it Whitman. At any rate, where Whitman is now. Um, but that came down when they built that new building, when they built Whitman. And the Ray House became the director's house briefly. Um, the other big change was over at the, what's now the MRC area. Candle House was always there. And Candle House was where the, on the bottom floor, they had huge vats of various pickling materials, ethanol or whatever they were using for the dogfish and the squid and the other things that were going being sent out to colleges and universities for dissection or used here. And the upstairs is where the young men on the crew lived. No women on the crew in those days. The supply department was where the transport support or whatever it's called now, the, the wooden building is. And that was overseen by um, Francis Valois who would come for the summer. He was the brother of John Valois, who worked on the boats and then was head of the supply department, as I'll call it. Um, and that was an old building with wooden tanks for the organisms that the scientists needed that day. So they'd, they'd have the scallops and they'd have the brittle stars and they'd have the, the whatever, but they were in wooden tanks there. And upstairs, among the other things, was a collection of um, bottled and preserved specimens, most of which are over in Lurb now. Before the, the, the MBL supply dock was a boathouse, which you could get on by going down a narrow gangplank, and inside the boathouse the turn and the, and the sagitta were kept. They were relatively smaller boats. And on the dock itself, the same floating dock that's there now, with the tanks for the sea creatures underneath, if you've never pulled up part of the dock on there, the supply dock, you should go over and realize that they're still there. But they had three ships at the time that I was uh, mostly there. The Dolphin, the um, Nereus, um, Garbatia. And they would go out regularly to collect as they do today, but all three of them would be going out to wherever anything was needed. Let me tell you what the beach was like during the Watergate hearings. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I came to the MBL beach, but I also came to the little beach that's part of our, it didn't matter in those days. And while we had a general rule, no radios on the beach, because you were supposed to be watching children, or if you're children, you weren't listening to the radio, you were running around playing and getting in the water. But that was an exception, because everybody was so interested in what was going on. Um, and everybody listened. Everybody listened during the hearing, the McCarthy hearings. Uh, my mother took me to one of the McCarthy hearings. We were living in Washington, D.C. then, and I cried. He was such a mean, nasty man. Um, but every, everybody, everybody here, really of any age, would be tuned in during times like that. And again, today, since we're all connected and tuned in, it doesn't seem like such a miracle. But back then, to have 
everybody interested and knowing about what was going on really made uh, what a connection and the science has always been there and everybody gets along at least to an extent I know at my mother's um, service one very good friend who still lives in Woods Hole got up and said very quietly Susie knew that I was a Republican and we got along anyway <laughs> and I guess <laughs> that kind of summed up how it worked here but oh there, I mean every major moment in history of the U.S. was always a part of Woods Hole. Oh, the people. No, I, I don't think there's any question. I mean, of course you can get the organisms. It's a unique place with the, you know, the cold current water organisms and the warm water organisms. Um, but the people who collect them, the people who preserve them, the people who work on them, the fact that you can meet people in another discipline, totally different discipline, and have wonderful discussions, the lecture series, the, the lunches, when you're just talking, uh, talking science, or not talking science, talking music. They've always been connected with the music here, and we've always had wonderful musicians in the scientific community. So, good concerts, good dances, good... It's just a... Uh, a very special place to be as a child, to be as a, an adult, to be as a grandparent, which I am now. It's, it's special. This community allows people like me to be a part of it. Now I give um, tours for the MBL, and I have since nine, the early 1990s. I'm wearing a shirt as I, as I say this that has the names of the guides, and there are only about six of us, and there are names that go back through the MBL um, history. But the names of the scientists who open their labs are also on this shirt. We don't do that anymore because it's, they, they really can't be interrupted as much as they could then. But there were people, uh, Leonard Nelson, for example, would have the tours come in and he would have already set up a microscope so that they could see an Arbacea egg being fertilized. And they could see the little wall that the egg put up as soon as one of the sperm had made it in. And, it, and he'd allow 15 different people each have a piece at the microscope because we didn't have all the techniques for projecting those things. It wasn't that long ago, but it was 20 years ago. So um, I'm delighted that I can still be a part of it and give tours of the MBL and talk about it and come to the Friday lectures and if I don't understand the title of the lecture sometimes I'll go to the kids movie instead but otherwise the lectures are great. We firmly believe that it was through institutions like the MBL and the Oceanographic that brought scientists together and studied what came out of the ocean. I mean after all we came out of the ocean that this was what was so important. Um, one of the things my husband points out when he gives tours at Hui is that there are, I'm gonna get, I may get the numbers wrong, but I, I don't think so, that there are 10 to the 25th stars in the sky in the universe and 10 to the 29th organisms in the ocean. And we know more about the stars than we do about the organisms in the ocean. Um, and he was very, very, caught by that and so even though he worked mostly on frogs he worked on a muscle reaction where he worked as a um, laboratory director Taiwan Florida Hawaii Woods Hole so always with the ocean <laughs>